Along a stretch of Highway 60 in the Texas Panhandle lies this small city, the city of Hereford. A city of over 15,000 people equipped with a golf course, a movie theater, a few restaurants, and when the wind blows a certain direction, the smell of manure. Because the people of Hereford are outnumbered by cows by a factor of 40 to 1. Hereford and its surrounding landscapes are home to these. Massive animal feedlots, where cattle is fattened up during their last stages of life. This is the origin of that grocery store steak or that restaurant ground beef. And it's a far cry from the pastoral roots of animal agriculture. So how then did we get from this to this? The answer to that question is crucial because the shape of animal agriculture has massive ramifications around the world. It affects our climate, our water, our livelihoods, and the very food we put on our plate. Today, we dive headfirst into the muddy tracks of the meat industry in order to uncover exactly how much it's driving climate change. We'll discover why the city of Hereford raises cows in conditions like this, whether veganism makes sense as a solution, and why this man might give us a glimpse into a future with less meat. This video is better on Nebula. Use the link in the description below to support our changing climate directly by signing up for Nebula. There you can watch this video ad free and also watch over 25 OCC videos that I haven't released on YouTube, including my most recent bonus video diving into whether grass fed beef is actually good for the environment. Meat, the flesh of another animal made into food. The path of a steak or a slab of bacon from field to fork is one mired in exploitation and environmental harm. In part, this is because today's meat industry epitomizes capitalist commodification and exploitation in the name of accumulating profits. The process of meat production squeezes both animals and humans in order to assure prices stay low and profits stay high. In a 2002 interview with PBS Frontline, the CEO of the biggest meat lobbying firm, Patrick Boyle, admits just that. He explains that the reason they're able to keep the price of beef so low is that they've been continuously squeezing costs out of the process. This is really a euphemism for consolidation, mechanization, and exploitation. Three cornerstones of capitalist production. Because under capitalism, corporations are constantly jostling to edge out other competitors. And to get that edge, they buy up smaller companies for more share of the market, invest in new technology to lower the cost of production, and exploit workers through low wages and lax workplace safety. And we're seeing all of this play out on an international scale today with the meat industry. Since the 1970s, meat production has skyrocketed globally, with the number of pigs slaughtered per year reaching 1.4 billion and chickens slaughtered reaching 73 billion, which means that we slaughter roughly 191 million chickens every single day to satisfy our craving for meat. And aiding that rise of meat production is the concentration of animal processing into the hands of just a few big companies. In the US specifically, four corporations now own 85% of the meatpacking business. In the case of cows, this means that after calves have been raised on pasture and then sold to feedlots to quickly fatten them for slaughter, those four corporations are pretty much the only ones buying fully mature animals. They are the ones snatching up and slaughtering chickens, pigs, and cows to then package them up and sell them in grocery stores. So Tyson, JBS, National Beef Packing, and Cargill have immense control over not only the prices of meat, but how production is run. They are the bottleneck through which all meat must filter. And we saw this immense power at work during the pandemic. The cost of many of those meats we throw on the grill is spiking. Meat prices are now up as much as 25%. Some of the highest prices they've ever seen for their meat product. According to a White House report, prices of beef shot up since 2019, while the value of cattle declined during the same period. In other words, meat packers were forcing ranchers and feedlots to sell their cows for lower rates and then turned around and sold their processed meat for higher prices in grocery stores. Essentially, their consolidated power allowed them to get the most lucrative prices. Indeed, the profit margin of the big meat processors increased by 300% during the pandemic. But this consolidation is nothing new. Back in the early 20th century, there were five meat packers buying up and slaughtering meat. They were doing the exact same thing we're witnessing today. 
using their outsized share of the animal market to influence pricing and exploit workers and ranchers in order to make the most profit. But in 1921, the US government passed a law essentially breaking up this monopoly, and the Big Five's percentage of market control plummeted to around 25%. That is, until free market hawk Ronald Reagan took power in the 1980s and neoliberal policy sunk its teeth into the American legal system. With less antitrust oversight, meatpacking companies merged and bought up other companies over the next 40 years, slowly concentrating power into the four meat processing behemoths we live under today. As journalist Claire Kelloway notes in an interview with Vox, This drive to become bigger and to cut costs, pushing more destructive forms of livestock production. So the rise of more concentrated animal farms, which have huge externalized costs on the environment. This kind of monopoly power is the logical conclusion of a capitalist system. Consolidation means feedlots have to increase in size to cater to the meatpacker's scale. Ranchers have to accept the prices set by the big four, and workers within meatpacking production must shoulder the conditions and wages these conglomerates set. All because there are few other options. This monopoly power allows corporations to, as Patrick Boyle said, squeeze every last drop of profit out of the meat production process. Which means that consolidation leads to increased exploitation. Whether that's exploitative wage systems, like in the case of chicken farmers, who have only received an increase of two and a half cents per pound of poultry since 1988, despite the wholesale price of chicken rising by 17.4 cents per pound during the same period or exploitative conditions within slaughterhouses and meatpacking facilities run by the likes of Tyson and JBS. Their conditions are dismal. Not only for animals, but also for those that must sell their labor to live. Over 100 miners have been working overnight shifts and employed to clean slaughterhouses in dangerous conditions across the Midwest. According to data from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, meat plant workers suffer an average of two amputations every single week. Whether that's limbs sucked into cubing machines or digits severed by a saw, both animals and humans are forced to shed blood and flesh to put that slab of meat onto the dinner table. But that's just for amputations. The rate of serious injuries in meat processing plants is a little over four per week. And yet the median hourly wage for such hazardous work is $16.94, a pittance when compared to the profits the big four meat packers are pulling in. Despite this rampant worker exploitation, not to mention the exploitation of billions of animals, this system remains invisible to the consumer. Capitalism has deftly removed us consumers from any glimpse of the production process. The mechanization of the animal production process, whether through dairy pump machines or meat processing assembly lines, has meant that fewer and fewer people are coming into contact with the animals we kill to live. We are alienated from the very things we put in our mouth. As a result, it's hard to care about the impact of a feedlot on the environment or the workers within a slaughterhouse when you are halfway across the world eating something that looks nothing like an animal. Capitalism has turned meat into a commodity to be bought and sold. Its value has been transformed from one of taste and quality to one of profit and quantity. And this drive to consolidate, exploit, and mechanize has had a catastrophic toll on the environment around us. Death lies where the Mississippi River meets the sea. There in the Gulf of Mexico is one of the biggest hypoxic dead zones in the world. A strip of ocean where oxygen levels are so low that most sea life is unable to live. And this is all thanks to agriculture, most prominently animal agriculture. If we travel back up the Mississippi for a moment, we'll witness thousands upon thousands of farms whose excess chemical fertilizers, nutrients, and manure are draining into waterways. Waterways that trickle down and eventually flood into the Gulf of Mexico, where those nutrients from feedlots and farms concentrate into a large scar gouged out of the ocean. These nutrients, like nitrogen and phosphorus, are the stuff of life for algae. But when an excessive amount of animal manure and fertilizer rich with those nutrients builds up in waterways, things get bad quickly. Algae explode in numbers, sink to the bottom, decompose, and in the process consume the water's oxygen supply. The absence of oxygen is what's causing that Gulf of Mexico dead zone. But unfortunately, that strip of unlivable water is not unique. 
There are 415 dead zones across the world that are fed by the massive nutrient load from corn and soybean farms for animal feed and animal feedlots themselves. But these dead zones are just one part of a much larger picture of the meat industry's impact on our lives and environment. While there are many ethical and nutritional concerns surrounding meat, today we're only going to focus on animal agriculture's outsized impact on the environment, the most prominent of which is climate change. If we head back to the city of Hereford in Texas, we can see the meat industry's emissions crisis in full swing. There, where roughly 1 million cows are stuffed full of corn and soybeans, clouds of methane hang heavy in the air. Not only does the very particulate matter from manure get kicked up into the air poisoning the surrounding town, but cows, especially cows forced to gain weight very quickly to eke out even more profit in industrial feedlots, create a lot of methane gas. While methane doesn't linger in the atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide does, it is 25 times more effective in trapping heat. So while it almost seems ridiculous, cow farts are a substantial actor in driving climate change. Indeed, the animal industry is responsible for for 16.5% of all annual global greenhouse gas emissions, with beef leading the charge. Capitalism has turned animals into machines, and like every other extraction industry, it doesn't consider the emissions and harm those machines generate. If we dig down into the specifics of meat, however, emissions associated with animal farming are not unilaterally catastrophic. There is a yawning gap between the greenhouse gas intensity of beef and that of chickens. In part, that's because the energy input needed to raise a cow for slaughter is massive. Indeed, just in the US, roughly 75% of cropland is devoted to animal feed. Because for every 100 kilocalories we put into a cow, we only receive 2 kilocalories out. Essentially, we're growing a substantial amount of plants that require a substantial amount of fossil fuels and fossil fuel derived fertilizer just to put those plants into the bodies of an animal that will then kill and eat. Of course, there is an argument to be made that if cows were raised on pasture their whole lives, they won't need the animal feed industry. But grass-fed beef is still a complicated issue. I've made a whole bonus video delving into the effectiveness of grass-fed beef, which you can watch right now on Nebula if you want to learn more. But the crucial point is this. While there are some types of meat like chicken that have significantly less impact, the reality is that all industrial animal agriculture, which is just about every steak or chicken breast you grab off the grocery store shelf, has a higher emissions footprint than plant proteins. But the meat industry's direct emissions from methane and animal feed is just the tip of the iceberg. Industrialized animal agriculture also requires a substantial amount of land. The driving forces of capitalism to ever increase the scale, efficiency, and exploitation of inputs in order to squeeze out the most profits has meant the continued conquest of habitable land by the meat and dairy industry. Today, the bleeding edge of animal agriculture's insatiable appetite for land lies in Brazil on the slashed and burned perimeter of the Amazon rainforest. Agriculture occupies almost half of the habitable land on this planet, and of that 46%, grazing lands and lands used to grow animal feed take up 77%. And yet only 18% of the global calorie supply comes from meat, while 82% comes from plants. Not only is land needed to grow crops to fuel the fattening process at feedlots, but animals need a lot of space to graze during the first two-thirds of their life. In short, meat production requires substantial land input for comparatively little output. And while some land that animals graze on is unsuitable for vegetables and plant proteins, there are still cases like Brazil, the biggest country in South America who is the world's biggest meat exporter. Brazil reveals just how destructive this capitalist meat system can be. Searching for ever more territory to range cattle and grow soybeans, ranchers and farmers have slashed and burned vast swaths of the Brazilian Amazon especially under former right-wing president Jair Bolsonaro. The second consecutive month of rising forest destruction under the presidency of Jair Bolsonaro. A 2019 investigative report revealed that 5,800 square kilometers of forest was being cut down every year in the Amazon and other areas in Brazil to be converted into cattle pasture. Pastures whose cows were bought up by meatpacking giant JBS, 
slaughtered and shipped off to European and American markets. This deforestation and destruction of habitat in the name of more land for feed and grazing is happening across the planet. And as I talked about extensively in my last video, this pressure for more land for meat is a significant driver of the sixth mass extinction. We are carving up crucial ecosystems in order to put meat on our plates. To add insult to injury, this extensive habitat destruction has meant that we are increasingly bumping up against wild animals. Animals which can cause pandemics. And when diseases don't make the jump from animals in native ecosystems, contagions can spawn and multiply in the petri dishes of feedlots and slaughterhouses. Epidemics like the bird flu and SARS were born out of the reality of industrial meat factories. Consistent contact with wild and domestic animals has made the chance of another global pandemic that much more likely. So on top of climate change, land use, deforestation, and biodiversity loss, the production of meat under a capitalist system is spawning new diseases that, as COVID has revealed, our world is ill-equipped to tackle. In short, the meat industrial complex has heaped the negative consequences of mechanized animal production onto us and our surroundings, all the while hoarding the benefits for just a select few. If we know that the meat industry under capitalism is exploitative and destructive, what then should we do about it? How should we begin to approach the massive struggle of dismantling this harmful system? The answer to that question always seems to be going vegan. Without fail, when you talk about the destruction of the meat industry, veganism always comes up as the solution. Indeed, the UN, Project Drawdown, and a whole host of animal advocates. Now I stopped eating meat because I learned about the intensive animal agriculture. And you can make a difference by even once a day or once a week choosing not to eat animals or animal products. All proposed plant-based diets as a significant solution to climate change and environmental degradation. On an individual level, that is certainly true. The research shows that for those who live in the imperial core who are seeking a way to shrink their carbon footprint, adopting a plant-rich diet is one of the most effective actions. That's because, as I mentioned before, growing plants is significantly less emissions and land intensive than raising animals for slaughter. We can see here that even the largest carbon footprint of plant proteins, tofu, is smaller than the smallest carbon footprint of meat and dairy products. Indeed, a meta-analysis of over 700 food production systems asserts ruminant meat had impacts 20 to 100 times those of plants, while milk, eggs, pork, poultry, and seafood had impacts 2 to 25 times higher than plants. Study after study has found that eating a plant-based diet lowers your personal carbon footprint. And when considering the range of climate action tactics available to us, going vegan is much easier than welding a pipeline valve shut. It might give agency to those who otherwise feel like they can't change anything about the climate crisis. But veganism has a number of pitfalls that must be addressed. For one, veganism attempts to use consumer side power to influence production side destruction. Veganism, while certainly one of the best things you can do as an individual, still buys into and reinforces the myth of consumer change. Under a capitalist system, transformation doesn't come from the point of consumption, but from the point of production. The owners of our systems of production, the slaughterhouses, the meatpacking plants, and feedlots, have immense control of how many cows are raised or how many chicken tenders are sold. Which is why meat production has tripled since the 1970s despite a significant adoption of plant-based diets. So veganism should be seen as just one tactic and a broader toolkit to dismantle the destruction of animal agriculture. There are so many other tactics out there that might even have more of an impact than eating a solely plant-based diet. And yet a vegan diet always seems to be held up as the solution. In a way, this feels eerily similar to the carbon footprint shaming campaign enacted by British Petroleum. What size is your carbon footprint? Much in the same way fossil fuel emissions have become our individual problem, the meat industry's disastrous impact has to be somehow solved with our dietary decisions. As Matt Huber writes in Climate Change as Class War, under neoliberal capitalism, individual behavioral change sometimes appears to be the only meaningful option to do something about climate change. So while projections like this one that propose that if everyone adopted a plant-based diet, we could offset 68% of carbon emissions this century are extremely enticing, we need to be careful how we interpret that information. Everyone in the world will not just voluntarily take up a plant-based diet. 
Because despite the increasing popularization of meatless eating, the meat industry has a strong control of food production in the United States. Even plant-based alternatives like Beyond Meat, Impossible Burgers, and now Tyson's own plant-based line are still wrapped up and consumed by capitalist processes. They're patented and controlled not by the people democratically, but by just a few CEOs and investors who are often the same ones in the meat industry who are looking to profit off shifting diets. Not only that, but pushes for global veganism can be colored, perhaps unconsciously, by imperialist tendencies. As Max Isle writes in A People's Green New Deal, claiming that a meatless society is a good thing creates an immediate moral justification for doing things to stop people, especially pastoralists in the third world, from ceasing to raise or eat meat. What Isle is keying into here is that we must avoid a top-down approach to a vegan society, one where the imperial core's guilt over exploitative meat industrialism turns into backlash against peasant ranchers and the imperial periphery. The struggle must be taken to the Tysons and Cargills of the world, not those raising cows just to put food on the table. Because for many, there are also a number of cultural barriers to going vegan. Whether it's your grandma's famous turkey pot pie, the cattle ranged for subsistence, or the salmon your people have been fishing for hundreds of generations, meat can hold spiritual and communal significance. Plant-based diets, especially veganism, leave little room for those emotionally important meals. Because veganism, at its core, is a restrictive diet. One which, if we're not careful, might exacerbate already present disordered eating or give rise to it. In part, this is because it can often feel that if you take even just one bite of meat, you're immediately shamed as a bad vegan. And when you consider that meat is ever-present, especially in the US, in our stores, our restaurants, and even our clothes, it can be taxing both financially and mentally to find alternatives. All this is not to say that you shouldn't go vegan. Indeed, embracing a plant-based diet can be a great first step in acquiring agency under the meat industrial complex. But it is to say that embracing a plant-based diet can be extremely hard in a meat-centric world. Vegan activist Earthling Ed argues that the problem is not the restrictiveness of the vegan diet, but instead he argues that we should be focusing on making vegan food more accessible and convenient and tasty and affordable. And we should make sure that being vegan is a socially acceptable and normal thing to do so people don't feel isolated within their social groups. But in order to do that, veganism needs to be seen as just one small step. Because to forge a plant-based system and dismantle the meat industry, we need to tear down the very scaffolding of the system itself. Those support pillars that make a plant-based meal much more difficult to cook up. All across the planet, more people are embracing plant-rich diets. Whether for perceived nutritional benefits, ethical, or environmental reasons, animal-free diets seem to be growing in popularity. And yet, meat corporations continue to have a stranglehold over animal production. Profits and accumulation are still valued over environment, animals, and people. Meat production is still climbing. So we need a holistic approach to our food system. We need tactics beyond individual dietary choices to stop the destruction of the meat industry. Ones that unravel the tightly wound ties between capitalist extraction and animal production. This could look like immediate harm reduction strategies like stronger slaughterhouse oversight, increased antitrust pressure to break up global meat monopolies, and taxing meat packing companies for their emissions and waste. But these are ultimately solutions couched in our current system. They're imperfect forms of pressure that alleviate just a bit of the harm of the meat industry during the struggle for a more plant-based world. And crucially, that struggle must involve the ranchers, the pastoralists, and the animal farmers producing meat. We must get down in the dirt and actually help these workers transition away from the tight grip of the meat industry. And this is exactly what transformation is trying to do with farmers like Mike Weaver who raised chickens for years and, recognizing the heavy yoke of exploitative meat corporations, has successfully transitioned his operation to carbon-negative hemp farming, a crop that could potentially be a cornerstone for a zero-carbon economy. Weaver's farm represents what a transition to a plant-based world might look like, ripping away one node of production from the animal industry. Because the reality is that those closest to meat production have the most power. 
the slaughterhouse workers who risk life and limb every day, the chicken farmers paid dismally for their work, and cattle ranchers are all key agents of change under capitalist animal production. If just four meatpacking companies have immense power, that means that the workers within those companies have even greater power to dismantle their stranglehold over food. That means we need to build solidarity and coalitions across the meat and dairy supply chain. Because the only way to dismantle the global monopoly of animal production is to attack it from all sides. From the food we put on our plates, to strikes, to walkouts, all together can bring slaughterhouses to a standstill. Ultimately, going vegan is just one small step in a greater struggle that must end at the point of production. Only when we've wrested control of the very food we eat away from those hungry for profits and place it in the decision making of the people can we then begin a just transition away from the harmful impact of meat. A transition that must grapple with the ranchers and pastoralists raising their animals not in feedlots but on grassy pasture. Because recently there has been a rise in the number of advocates who claim that animals raised on pasture their whole life not only produce fewer emissions but actually can help the soil sequester more carbon than cows emit. Some arguments are dubious and some seem credible. So in order to get to the bottom of this, I made a whole extra video about grass-fed beef that you can only find on the creator-owned streaming service, Nebula. The fog of war in the grass-fed beef debate is thick with contradictory evidence. There, you can watch my upcoming video a month early, 25 bonus and extended OCC videos, alongside a ton of other exclusive content from creators like Second Thought, Not Just Bikes, and Real Life Lore. I've recently been learning a lot about the rise of fascism in Second Thought's Nebula original series, F is for Fascism, and how fascism so effectively became the way of life for an entire country. And I also highly recommend watching the beautifully produced hour and a half documentary about the growing water crisis surrounding the Colorado River by Wendover Productions. Things are worse than we're actually able to describe them right now because we just don't have the language or the measurements to do that. And on top of all of that, Nebula has a whole host of classes from creators like Simon Clark. But how do we actually tell that story in an effective way? And Tom, Nicholas. How to research like a PhD student. Which has definitely helped improve my video making and research skills. Signing up for Nebula using my link is the best way to support our changing climate. It's like Patreon combined with Netflix, but better for me and you. And I've got an exclusive deal for you right now. If you sign up for Nebula using the link on screen or in the description, you can get 40% off per year, which is just $2.50 a month. Signing up for Nebula is the single best way to support our changing climate. And in the process, you can watch my videos a month early, get access to all my ad-free exclusive videos, and support a blossoming collective of educational creators.